Greetings everybody and welcome back to another video. This morning I did something pretty silly. I left my lav mic at home so I thought I had to ditch this video recording session but I realized I brought my earphones with me so I just put my earphone microphone onto this whiteboard marker so hopefully this does fine as a microphone for now. Um, the aircon's going absolutely nuts in this room today for some reason so hopefully there's not too much background noise. Um, but yeah, what exactly are we doing today? We're taking a look at this integral, this improper integral, um, found this one on Stack Exchange and turns out a complex solution is pretty nice for it. Yeah, so how exactly do we approach these sorts of integrals usually? Um, you notice we have the sine of x here, so usually we like to replace sine of x with something like e to the i times x, so we could try to do that, so we could try to rewrite this integral as what, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of what, the imaginary part of uh, something, and you could try to choose, for instance, well, e to the i of x in place of the sine here. So if you take the imaginary part of it, you recover the sine of x. And then you could put a plus or a negative and then an x over here if you want to. Um, but the problem with that is because we're going to be integrating with an x, x is going to be a real number. And what's the imaginary part of a real number? Well, it's exactly zero. So if you set it up in this form over here, it's not going to work out because you lose the x because of the imaginary part. So the fix to that is just to put an extra i there. So when you do take the imaginary part, you do get the x back, and then you get the negative sign as you, you know, as we wanted at the very start. And then we still got this divided by x cubed over here, so that's fine, um, because x cubed, it's gonna be a real number, so you can just bring it into the imaginary parts operator without any issues. Now you could go ahead and try to contour integrate this guy, might work out, I don't know, um, but it's actually not gonna work out, because one of the palms over little gamma around the origin, it's going to completely blow up if you use this function here to integrate. Um, and the, really the trick to resolving that is you just put an extra plus one at the start here. Um, it's a pretty nice trick because it's gonna cancel out with one of the things that's gonna blow up. Um, you'll see where that comes from later. Um, but if you take the imaginary part of this one here, it's zero. So taking the imaginary part of this whole thing, it's really gonna recover what we had at the very start anyway. So yeah, we are all good there. Okay, and the next thing we can do is we can bring the imaginary part out of the operator. So this integral is m integral of one plus i times x and then minus e to the i times x divided by x cubed. And yeah, basically this is going to be the function we're going to be contour integrating. So we're going to define our function f of z to be exactly this guy here. So we're going to let um, yeah, f of z be equal to 1 plus i times z minus e to the i times z divided by z cubed. And you might notice that there's going to be a pole at 0 as well. It's a pole at um, yeah, z equals 0. Okay, so if we want to set up some kinds of contour integral because we want to go from negative infinity to infinity and we want to avoid the pole at zero, well, the most suitable choice of contour to use it would just be some kind of semicircular contour with an indent at zero. So let's draw that up. So our contour is going to look something like this. Um, is there red somewhere? I believe there's red in this in this tray somewhere. So we put a polar at z equals zero here. We want to avoid that guy. And then we'll go from, let's say, negative r to negative epsilon, and then from epsilon up to r, um, indent, and then semicircle. So we'll go along this path in the positive direction. So um, yeah, anti-clockwise, like so. Um, and the idea is we're just going to take the limit as r approaches infinity and as epsilon approaches zero in order to recover the integral that we want, which is up over here um, on the real axis, essentially. So we are going to do this. Okay, so now let's write out a few integrals for us to yeah, work around. So we have the integral, the contour integral over c, first of all. So contour integral over c of our function f of z dz. Now, what exactly is that going to evaluate? So it's actually very simple because the region inside this contour is completely analytic. So if I call the integral theorem, it's just going to evaluate to zero. I think I drew that contour slightly lopsided, but yeah, it does the job for now. So contour integral evaluates to zero. And we can split up the contour integral over each of these individual paths over here. So this is the integral from negative r to negative epsilon plus the integral from epsilon to r and then plus the integral and um, I forgot to call these paths something and um, this contour we call c by the way and then we have the path a gamma and then the path a big gamma at the top there so that big arc so we have plus the integral over the gamma paths so plus integral over gamma and then integral over big gamma okay and now we just have to evaluate these integrals so it's not too tricky to do actually these two integrals in the limit as yeah r approaches infinity 
n epsilon approaches zero, these two guys, they are going to combine to give you the integral from negative infinity to infinity of, yeah, that guy over there. So one plus, um, we have i times x minus e to the i times x divided by x cubed. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, there's still going to be a singularity at x equals zero. So if you want to be precise about this, this is technically the principal value, so I might put an extra PV here, um, yeah, just in case it is, I guess. Um, so these two integrals evaluate to well, what we have here, and now we just have to evaluate the integrals over the, the little gamma and then the integral over big gamma. And that's not too bad to do. First of all, the integral over big gamma, I'm not gonna show that in this video, but the integral over big gamma, that's gonna go to zero because you can argue by Jordan's lemma, um, you can split up this fraction, for instance, into this irrational part, first of all, and then you have this e to the iz over some yeah, polynomial. Jordan's lemma on the exponential over the polynomial, um, it tells you that the integral over the gamma part goes to zero, and then you have this rational part here, and you can use Jordan's lemma on there as well, because the degree of the numerator, the polynomial on the numerator, is less than the degree of the denominator. So the integral of v gamma in the limit does indeed go to zero, so we don't have to worry about this. I made a video on Jordan's lemma, so you can check that out if you really want to. But now let's take a look at the integral over little gamma. So how exactly can we do that? So integral over little gamma of f of z integrated with respect to z. First of all, and um, we want to parameterize this part a little bit. Notice it's just a little semicircle. So let's do a parameterization here. So we're going to let z be equal to epsilon e to the i theta. And then we can differentiate both sides to get the differential dz, which is going to be i epsilon e to the i theta, d theta. And then what are the range of values for theta? Well, we're going from an angle of pi here back to zero. So theta is going to range from pi all the way back to zero like so. Okay, so we just plug this guy in now. So this is the integral from um, pi back to zero. Now, what exactly is f of z? It's this function here. So we just plug our parameterization in. So we have one plus i, z is epsilon e to the i theta. Okay, and then we have minus e to the i. Z, once again, is epsilon e to the i theta. We divide this guy by z cubed, but that's going to be epsilon e to the i theta, but then cubed. And then what exactly is dz? Well, it's i, which we can bring out to the front. And then we have an epsilon e to the i theta integrated with respect to theta. So there's an absolute mess going on there. But we can simplify things a little bit. For instance, we have the, yeah, epsilon e to the i theta cubed here. We can cancel with this factor out here and reduce this down to a square. Okay, and well, we can flip the bounds of integration as well. Um, and then, yeah, we put the negative outside. So what exactly is that going to look like? I'll write it over here. So this is going to give us negative i integral from zero to pi of, um, okay, so we're going to have one over epsilon e to the i theta, that's squared, so one over epsilon e to the i theta, um, but then this thing here is squared. And now I have this numerator left, so that numerator is going to be equal to one plus i, and then epsilon e to the i theta, and then now we have a minus this e to the i stuff over here. Now, with this guy, what I'm going to do is we're going to turn this into a Taylor series expansion. So we have minus, what exactly is the Taylor series expansion of e to the something? Well, it's the sum from k is equal to zero to infinity of, well, it's going to be the stuff in the exponent, which is i times epsilon e to the i theta raised to the kth power, and we're going to divide this guy by, yeah, k factorial. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to expand that, that sum a little bit. I'm going to break it up, in particular, the first two terms, because something rather cool is going to happen. So let's write it down over here. Now, what are the first two terms of that sum there? Well, the first term, it's going to give us a negative, and then what happens if you plug in k equals zero? Well, you're going to get well, something to the zero, which is one, divided by zero factorial, which is also one. So in fact, you're going to get a minus one here from the sum, okay, and then you have minus. What else do you have? Or well, what happens if you plug in k equals one x? Well, you're going to get i times epsilon e to the i theta divided by one factorial, so we don't have to worry about that. And this is really quite cool there because you notice we have a bunch of terms canceling out. So one will, and one will cancel 
and this exponential stuff will cancel. And that's exactly the reason why we needed the extra one in there uh, at the very start, because without the one, we're going to pick up this negative one here. And because we have this epsilon squared factor in the denominator, as epsilon approaches zero, it's just gonna completely blow up. So that one here kind of comes in and saves the day. Okay, so what else do we have? We still have the sum there, so let's write minus the sum from k equals, oh, we took the first two terms, and so now we're starting at k equals two. We run up to infinity of, we have, uh, yeah, i, epsilon e to the i theta, raised to the k, but I'm gonna write this as i to the k, and then epsilon e to the i theta to the k here, divided by k factorial, um, and then all this is integrated with respects to theta. Now, why did I split that up? It's because now that all these guys are gone here, we can, cancel this epsilon e to the i theta squared with part of this factor over here. So this is going to completely cancel out. And now instead of just the k at the top there, we're going to have a k minus two. Okay, so now what exactly are we left with? We're left with, um, first of all, we have this negative over here, which we can bring out and we can cancel with this negative. So more stuff cancel, I guess. So we're going to be left with essentially i times the integral of the sum, but we can pull the sum outside of the integral actually, and we're going to get the sum from k is equal to two to infinity of, we can write i to the k over k factorial because those are just constants. We also have, let's bring up the epsilon as well, so epsilon to the k minus two, and then we can integrate from zero to pi of e to the i theta raised to the k minus two d theta. Okay, so now notice what happens if you take for example, the limit as epsilon approaches zero. So what exactly happens? So epsilon approaches zero now. Well, notice when k is equal to two, you're not gonna get an epsilon at all because we're gonna get a two minus two here. So epsilon to the zero is just a one. So you're not gonna see the epsilon term when k equals two. So when k equals two, you're independent of epsilon pretty much. And also the same happens with this integral because you're going to be left with two minus two. So something to the zero, which is one. So when k equals two, you're integrating one from zero to pi. So you notice when k equals two, you're independent of epsilon. So it doesn't even matter if epsilon approaches zero, you're just going to get i times, well, i to the k here, that's going to become negative one when k equals two, divided by two factorial, that's going to be two. And then, well, we don't see the epsilon, but we do see the integral because we're integrating one, and that's just going to give us pi. Okay, but when epsilon is three or greater, we're going to pick up these epsilon factors over here. And because epsilon's gonna to go to zero, and this integral, by the way, it's always going to be finite as well. Because epsilon's gonna to go to zero, all those other terms are going to vanish as well. So we don't care about all these other terms. So this is basically what we get when epsilon approaches zero. We're just going to get negative i times pi divided by two. Okay, and that's basically it for the integral over this gamma path here. We've found its value, it's just, yeah, negative i times pi over two, which is pretty cool. Um, so this guy, and now it's negative i times pi over two. So basically, we've got all the parts of this integral now, so we'll finish up in this little corner. So in the end, what exactly do we have? We have zero is equal to, well, we had this integral over here, and notice this is, what well, we have an extra negative i times pi over two, and the integral over a big amount that just goes to zero. Okay, and now we just have to solve this guy over here. It's quite simple because we just bring this i pi into the other side, and this integral just evaluates to i times pi over two pretty much. And yeah, we're basically done now. We just need to take the imaginary part on both sides because remember, the original integral i that we wanted, let's call this integral j or something, I don't know. Um, the original integral i here, that's just the imaginary part of j, but what the imaginary part of j is just going to be, huh, there's no more i here, it's just going to be pi on two. And that's going to be the final result of today's video. So yeah, pretty simple results. The solution's fairly nice as well. I like the part with the Taylor series expansion and the ones cancelling, which is pretty cool. But yeah, that's pretty much all for this video. If you guys have any integral suggestions, feel free to let me know. And yeah, up until the next one, hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone in the next one. Bye-bye.